Tonight on CFDK TV News, the BC United Party is trying to move forward after some major defections. A search for missing hikers has been suspended for now, and Canadian veterans recently visited the site where they fought on D-Day 80 years ago. Northwest BC's only television news team. We are CFTK TV News. Good evening, I'm Kael Baslett and here's what's making news in the Northwest and beyond for today. An idea has come up as a way for men to help men and build an age-friendly community. The Men's Shed Association of BC is looking to establish men's sheds in Northwest communities. CFTK TV's Jaylene Matthews has more. It's a place to belong where men can engage in meaningful projects, learn new skills, and combat isolation. Representatives of the Men's Shed Association of BC are currently touring the Northwest, presenting about men's sheds and what they do. It's part of our outreach program to hopefully get new sheds started. And I'm, an, I'm from Fraser Lake. We've already done um, heading north, because we were the furthest north, so we've already done Burns Lake, Houston, and Smithers. We're struggling with getting Houston going, but both Smithers and uh, Burns Lake got going within a month. Audrey Fenema is the treasurer of the association. She says the group can really help men who may be struggling with isolation and loneliness. A lot of men after they retire, they are sort of at the end of what do I do now? Because they may have been in some kind of trade and now what do I do? And they can go to men's sheds and maybe start some of these. They're also a place where some will just be a coffee shop for a while and you get a chance to chat. And I know they call it getting out from under women's foot syndrome, but it's also builds up confidence. They give back to the community because they do various things for the, they can do various things for the community. And so they feel like they've got a new purpose in life. Association President Jan Fenema says the movement has made big differences in the lives of many seniors. So in Ireland, the medical system there did a, a survey or study on it, and not a survey, and they believe in 2022 they had 135 men that uh, they prevented from committing suicide just because of having men sheds in their area. Um, and the depression that men go through, like a lot of times men don't want to be a burden on their wives or their spouses or anything, or even friends. So they, a lot of times when they fall into a really big depression, they'll go hide in the basement or sit and drink in the basement all by themselves and eventually till they die. And this way they have, uh, they, they have a purpose in life again. It gives them a purpose. Uh, most sheds have something to do with giving something back to the community. The group will be presenting and recruiting at the Terrace Sportsplex at 10 a.m. on the 11th of June. Men and women are welcome to attend. For CFTK TV News in Terrace, I'm Jaylene Matthews. The City of Terrace has recently made the choice to issue a rare cleanup order due to the less than ideal state of a certain property. The property in question is at 442 Greg Avenue and it has become home to so much material that it's even considered as a fire hazard for both the home as well as its nearby neighbors. So now the city is ordering for the debris to be removed, but the cleanup process isn't expected to be easy, according to city officials. The reason for that is because the property owner has been seemingly unwilling to remove materials, and there is just so much of it at this point that a bylaw officer couldn't gain access to the property in their attempt to get updated documentation of how the pileup currently looks. Drug overdose deaths are said to be down by around 24% between April of last year and April of this year, but still BC's coroner stated that 182 people have died in total. Fentanyl remains as the primary killer, with the drug detected in 82% of test results for those who died so far this year. The coroner service has also stated that nearly half of those who overdosed were between the ages of 30 and 40 died. The latest figures have lifted the number of deaths since the public health emergency was declared eight years ago to 14,582 people. Behind in the polls and coping with candidates who suddenly jumped ship, Kevin Falcon and the BC United Party are trying to turn the page. Their strategy is to woo voters with a hot topic issue that they say the NDP failed to fix. Rob Buffum has the details. 
targeting young families and an unfulfilled NDP promise, Kevin Falcon and his BC United party are pledging $10 a day childcare. We are going to fix this problem immediately. The plan for middle and lower income individuals is based on income and gives subsidies to families, ensuring they pay no more than $200 a month for childcare. It also touts tax credits for parents or grandparents who babysit from home. This is how we're actually going to get to a place where people actually get affordable daycare, not just something that's been talked about for eight years by the NDP. In the past two elections, the NDP have pledged $10 a day daycare across the province. So what's the difference? Well, not everyone has it. The criticism is that it's not happening fast enough. BC United's pitch, like the NDP's, involves promises for higher wages to attract more early childhood educators and using schools and hospitals for daycare. But the approach is flawed, say some critics. Cash transfers to parents don't help buy childcare if it doesn't exist. And we've seen that the market-based approach is not the solution. Today's announcement, days after two MLAs defected to the BC Conservatives, Falcon wouldn't guarantee there wouldn't be more defections, but insisted he's not worried. Our caucus is solid and our candidates are solid and we're focused on the future. Pundits say for the party's future, it needs a big announcement to change the narrative of free falling polls. Put out that big idea that gets everyone talking about his policy. Wait till I start talking about health care and some of the other things. Child care is important to many voters. What's less certain, whether this plan will work or get voters' attention. Robert Buffum, CTV News, Esquimalt. Coming up next, police are trying to discover why a chef was murdered this week. Welcome back. Friends and family are in shock as they're trying to understand why a popular chef was stabbed to death early Wednesday morning. Vancouver police have confirmed the man killed in Chinatown was 32-year-old Wataru Kakauchi. Friends and colleagues gathered to remember him near the site where he was killed, and that's where CTV's Abigail Turner could be found as well. This video and the music now a lifelong memory of Waturo Kakiuchi, a chef who had a passion for playing guitar and of course cooking. Full of life, energy, always positive. The 32-year-old was shockingly killed in Vancouver's Chinatown Wednesday morning. He's being remembered by loved ones and his boss at Hapa Izakaya. One of those people that uh, was light up a room and uh, couldn't be an enemy of anybody. Police found Kakiuchi suffering from stab wounds on Main and Union Street around 3.30 a.m. Paramedics were unable to save him. Investigators were seen searching for information to figure out what happened in the hours before he was killed. We want everybody to know this is a priority investigation. It's all hands on deck. We're doing everything that we can not only to solve this murder, but to provide a sense of safety and comfort to people who are in that neighborhood. Kakiuchi, who is originally from Japan, was in Canada for a number of years on a work permit. Mayor Ken Sim expressed his condolences online, saying, quote, this senseless act of violence has our city in shock and mourning. This is just a normal guy. He was minded in his own business, not an aggressive guy. And that's why his friends can't understand why anyone would want to hurt him. With no one in custody, it leaves more questions than answers for those who were close to him. I just want to make sure that, you know, the news cycles, this is probably gone in a day or two and uh, if this helps you know keep some of his memory alive I think it's important. Police say they have increased patrols in the area and anyone with information is asked to contact them if they have video surveillance footage as well. Abigail Turner CTV News Vancouver. There is growing concern for the safety of three men missing in the backcountry. Crews recently decided to suspend the search for the mountaineers because the conditions are too dangerous. They've been missing for nearly a week in Garibaldi Park, and making it worse, the area just got almost a meter of snow. CTV's Ben Milger reports. It's not the news anyone was hoping for. Crews have been forced to stand down air and ground operations in the search for three mountaineers who did not return from an ambitious and challenging expedition to Atwell Peak last Friday. 
finally able to lift off, search and rescue volunteers have been flying missions over Atwell Peak and the surrounding area in Garibaldi Park. Heavy clouds that shrouded the mountain for days have lifted enough to allow crews to get close enough to use a RECO detector, which can pick up a signal if someone's outdoor clothing is equipped with the technology. So far, there have been no hits in the steep and rugged terrain where the missing people are thought to be. Search and rescue crews have been assisted by RCMP and avalanche technicians with dogs have also been flown into the area. However, dangerous avalanche conditions have prevented teams from conducting an extensive ground search in areas where as much as a meter of fresh snow has fallen since the trio were reported missing. With crews grounded, the focus will turn to video analysis as volunteers comb over footage captured by drones flying close to the mountain over the past two days. The missing mountaineers are reported to be very experienced and well equipped, but with each passing day, concern for their safety and well-being grows, especially now that the search has been suspended. Ben Milger, CTV News, Squamish. Turning to tonight's weather, the north coast is likely to deal with some increasing cloudiness at a low at 10 degrees. The Terrace Kinnebet area will get a few clouds of their own as well as a low at 10 degrees. And the Bulkley Valley and Lakes District is supposed to see some clear skies but a low down at minus 3 degrees. On the north coast, the upcoming week will be made up of a mix of partly sunny and cloudy days as well as rainy days with their high moving from 16 to 12 degrees. In the Terrace Kinemat area, their next week or so will go back and forth between sunny and cloudy days and rain days with the high shifting from 24 to 14 degrees. And in the Bulkley Valley and Lakes District, the week for them will get a little more sun but still deal with clouds too and showers while the high bounces between 24 and 16 degrees. Checking out the highways now, visit Drive BC for the latest and up-to-date conditions and as always, drive safe out there. On Highway 16, there is utility work, bridge maintenance, road sweeping, construction work, roadside brushing, paving operations, a geotechnical investigation, and a few special events. Highway 37 has some roadside brushing, maintenance, and frost teams, some more road maintenance work on the Nishka Highway, and the Telegraph Creek Road has muddy sections and frost teams. And this is what the roads were looking like this afternoon around the region from the view of the province's highway cams. Still to come is a look at the looming staff crunch in the Fraser Valley's hospitals. Welcome back. Another summer staffing crunch is looming for some Fraser Valley hospitals. Several emergency departments have little or no physician coverage, and that could lead to even longer waits for patients. Doctors are being offered thousands of dollars per shift, but as Penny Daflos reports, even the big incentives aren't working. No one wants to end up at the emergency department, but we're all glad they're there. Since the pandemic, it's been hard to find enough doctors to keep British Columbia's EDs running, especially after the end of the school year. It's a challenge every summer, but our team at Fraser Health is committed to meeting that challenge. Multiple sources tell CTV News there are four hospitals in that health authority with critical staffing shortages. So short that Langley Memorial, Abbotsford Regional and Peace Arch hospitals are offering bonuses to convince qualified doctors to pick up more shifts. The biggest carrot of them all, Mission Memorial Hospital is offering up to $4,125 to work a weekend overnight shift. Emergency medicine is intense and grueling work and the Doctors of BC confirms we know that several emergency departments do not have enough physicians right now. That means existing physicians have to work much harder while leading to longer waits for patients. Sources tell CTV News staff at those smaller hospitals are fearful of repercussions for speaking up even when raising concerns about patient safety. There's also nervousness around a new agreement being negotiated much like the one the province struck last year 
with family doctors. You're going to see in the coming uh, days and weeks is an extension of that model to other areas of the healthcare system, including hospitals. In the meantime, patients should brace for another summer of long waits for hospital care as some doctors take their own vacations from very intense jobs. We got to make sure their uh, their jobs are doable so that we're retaining doctors in the emergency room, not just adding new doctors. And that's why you see all of the initiatives that have been put in place. And um, if we need to do more, we're doing more. Penny Daflot, CTV News, Vancouver. The nearby community is outraged after learning the Kitsilano pool in Vancouver will remain closed this summer. It's been closed for two years and taxpayers have poured millions of dollars into repairing the popular site. And now it has some questioning if it's even worth fixing at all at this point. CTV's Yasmin Gandam has the city's response. Empty for months and months, not a single swimmer. Some are wondering whether it's even worth keeping. I think it's disgusting that they shouldn't, that they haven't been on top of this, they knew about it, and they didn't fix it. They can build the bike lanes, we can have the soccer, but they can't fix a pool. Well, not fix one anyway. Kitts is one of Vancouver's most popular and iconic outdoor pools, and it will be closed all summer long. Such a huge thing then for this community. We've uh, been swimming in that pool for 30 years. We did not get a request from the park board um, for this work, and this has been done through leadership from city staff. And so I think part of what we're trying to do is simplify the processes. Not only are taxpayers on the hook for any repair costs, but the city is also losing dollars. Every year, the pool sees an average of 135,000 users. It's going to be an expensive proposition to do that. It's a major capital project. Um, but again, we're going to look at prioritizing that in the capital plan. And what we're going to do is try to keep the existing pool um, short up uh, to extend that life in the meantime. The, the damage is substantive. And so I think really the question is, um, if people want to have a pool down at Kitts Beach, it's really about a replacement. The discussion has to be about replacement. UBC researchers point to a larger issue of whether or not climate change is making outdoor public pools a possibility. Especially in the case of Vancouver, where you see a lot of precipitation and a lot of variable climate, especially in the summer, there is an increased difficulty in maintaining that water quality. That the park board decided to, to hand over the maintenance of our, our pools and our community centers to the city of Vancouver. So the city of Vancouver has been in charge of maintaining all of our recreational infrastructure for over 10 years. It's a summer bummer for sure, but the city says it will do everything in its power to ensure this pool is up and running next summer. But we have heard that before. Yasmin Gantam, CTV News, Vancouver. It's been 80 years since the D-Day invasion, the Allied Forces military operation that was a turning point in the liberation of France, a critical invasion that took a devastating toll on the front lines. A delegation of Canadian D-Day veterans traveled to France to that same beach to commemorate both loss and victory. CTV's Joy Malbon has more. On a day to celebrate the last living witnesses to a battle that arguably changed the world, there was symbolism and skydivers, but only a handful of Canadian veterans who were actually there. Boots on the ground storming the beaches of Normandy, on the sea and in the air. Their average age now, 100. Greeted by royalty. Standing here today, in peaceful silence. It is almost impossible to grasp the courage it would have taken to run into the fury of battle that very day. Canadians pushing, persisting, determined in a campaign to free France, but it came at a terrible cost. 359 Canadians killed on D-Day alone, thousands more in the battles to come found their resting place here. There are no words to describe the immensity of the debt we owe you. The Prime Minister greeting Canada's most decorated veteran, General Richard Romer. Thirteen veterans in military uniform have made the trip. Captain Bill Wilson was part of the Allied landings in Normandy. He remembers. It was a bloody shame all those kids getting killed, I'll tell you. Sitting out there on the water, uh, 
craft. Seeing all those landing craft going into that on the beach, knowing that damn well that the Germans were waiting for them by that time. What an honor to see you here. This likely their last chance to return to the beaches to remember those kids and the soldiers that were lost. A last opportunity perhaps to celebrate the few survivors left as their memory becomes history, passing that torch of remembrance to a future generation. Joy Malvin, CTV News, Juneau Beach. And now we turn our attention to the stock markets. The Canadian dollar is down 29 tenths of a cent. The price of gold is down $65.90. Oil is down 2 cents. Natural gas is up 10 cents. Aluminum is up $25.50. In Toronto, the TSX is down 222.10 points. The Venture Index is down 13.73. In New York, the Dow Jones is down 87.18. And Nasdaq is down 39.99. Still ahead is a story on how many people don't check their tires in the summer. Welcome back. It's something many vehicle owners have to do every spring, switch from winter to summer tires. But as CTV's Pat Ford reports, many tire shops recommend getting your wheels checked again after making the switch, but a lot of drivers don't bother and that can be dangerous. When a tire comes off a vehicle, it can have catastrophic consequences. To try and prevent wheel separations, many tire shops ask customers to return following a tire switch after driving about 100 kilometers. The wheels are then retorqued to make sure they're tight. The tire just sort of came right off. Last month, Greg Pulver had his winter tire switch to summers at an oil change shop that also offered tire services. Five days and 250 kilometers later, the front wheel came loose from his car. It was pretty scary to be honest. You don't expect it, right? When the wheel came off, there was damage to the wheel hub, fenders, and undercarriage, totaling $6,700. Pulver complained to the tire shop the wheel must have been installed incorrectly. But the tire shop told him, we always emphasize with high importance that a retorque must be done between 40 to 100 kilometers. Pulver says while a retorque was suggested, he didn't feel it was mandatory. If they thought it was that important that, the, that it be done, that they would have put, um, put it on the receipt. The new procedure that we have in place, it takes away the necessity of coming back. Cal Tire says because some customers don't come back to have their wheels checked, it changed to a new procedure which doesn't require retorquing after 100 kilometers. Instead, the wheels are torqued to proper specifications and then a second torque check is performed. We torque those lug nuts on the hoist when we first fix that wheel on there. We, we back it off, apply the brakes firmly, put the vehicle in park, then we check all the lug nuts again. Oliver says his insurance company has written off his car and he'll have to buy another one. He still feels the tire shop he used should compensate him for the damage to his car. Pat Foran, CTV News. That is all of our news for now. From all of us here at CFDK TV News, I'm Kale Maslin and thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.